Welcome back guys. So I've been using the Embernic RG35XX Plus here for about a week or so and I absolutely love it. I loved the original model, but this thing being just as comfortable, having better controls and being more powerful, all make it a great device to use for long periods of time. And let me tell you, I've played it for long periods of time. I talked about this device briefly in my best portable emulators of 2023 video, but that was before I got the device and was purely based on expectations. And now that I have the device, I can say that it's met those expectations and it has earned its spot on my list. I want this video to be a review of this device, so I'm gonna bring up its predecessor as little as possible. But for the sake of specs, I think comparing the two is necessary. So this thing has quadrupled the RAM of the original at one gigabyte versus 256 megabytes. This is major because this thing can now play a lot more games than it was able to before. The GPU and CPU are better, the screen is the same, and the storage is the same. The battery is slightly bigger at 3300 milliamp hours compared to the 2600 milliamp hours, which Embernic claims adds two hours of playing time. The Plus adds Bluetooth, which lets you use external controllers over a wireless connection that isn't Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi also allows for multiplayer with other Plus models and Wi-Fi streaming, which is interesting. It has the same mini HDMI port on the top and the same vibration motor from the last device. The internals are pretty much the only thing that's Plus about this model. Ambernick says that the Plus model is 0.2 centimeters taller, but I do not notice it at all. It retails for $64, which was $6 more than the non-plus model, but the original has had its price cut several times and is on sale right now, even from its discounted price. So for now, the plus is $16 more. Who knows when that'll change if they drop the price of the original more. I mean, it just makes the original a better value, but also it's hard to compare the prices when they keep changing the price. The hardware is only slightly different from the original model, but the changes they made are improvements. For starters, they made the shoulder buttons slightly curved with the L2 and R2 buttons higher, so you can differentiate the buttons and press any of them much easier than on the original. This upgrade is based on a mod from the original that increased the size of the shoulder buttons. It's cool to see Ambernick listen to the people that bought their products and listen to their suggestions of how to make it better and actually implement it in their newer versions. Another upgrade made was the D-pad. Now, the D-pad on the original wasn't the worst thing in the world, but at least on the stock firmware, it really was nowhere close to the best. On the stock firmware, it would read a lot of diagonal inputs when I wouldn't even be close to hitting it, which was annoying, and while Black Serif's custom firmware did somewhat fix it, it still is prevalent whenever I turn on the device. I'll be scrolling through a menu and accidentally hit a diagonal input. It's really annoying. The Plus model seems to have fixed this issue with a whole new D-pad. The original had one that was very square, whereas this one is more rounded, and honestly, I prefer it. It's not as big, which is a downside on a device that's already so small, but it reads inputs correctly and feels nice when I put it in my hand, which puts it higher in my mind and just justifies its placement on my year-end list. The rest of the buttons are pretty much the same. If any of the face buttons actually feel different, I was not able to tell. They moved the start and select button slightly, which is probably just an internal thing that has to do with the board, but I thought I'd just point it out. The speaker on this one is actually significantly quieter than it was on the original. This isn't necessarily a bad thing since the original had speakers that at full volume would sound horrible, but I feel like the upgrade of any device having quieter speakers is not something you generally hear of. Usually they sound better and louder. These sound basically the same, but they just do not get as loud. Those are the only major hardware changes, I mean, aside from it being 0.02 kilograms heavier. And by major, I mean the only hardware changes. I literally can't find anything else that's different aside from the color. Oh yeah, the color. So this device comes in a smoky black kind of color, gray and white, which is different than the original's transparent white, transparent purple, and gray, which looked more like a beige than a gray. I'd say that the colors on here are better because while I loved the transparent purple on the original, I feel like it showed too much. Like I said, I think the transparent purple looks really nice, but this smoky black kind of color is a little more translucent and I think looks better under light and also doesn't show as much of the kind of like messy board they have underneath. The board isn't messy, but I mean like it doesn't look super like satisfying to look at. So seeing the smoky black that shows like enough of the inside will also 
not showing too much, I think is the kind of perfect medium. This thing is slightly thicker than the original because of the bigger battery and better internals, which I assume makes it heavier as well. But if you're used to the original's weight, this won't be a problem for you. I'm not sure what could make it a problem. Something small I do kind of want to mention is that the Plus model now has a back cover that you can take off to remove the battery. The original did not have that. And I don't, I'm not entirely sure why they added it, but I think there were some issues that were solved by removing the battery and putting it back in. So having this on the back now, so you can just unscrew to remove the battery, I think is a much nicer touch than having to take the entire case off like I did when mine stopped working a long while ago. Moving on from the hardware though, the software on here is very similar to the default software on the original. It is better solely because it has support for more consoles now and displays them well, but that doesn't really have anything to do with the software itself. They have released updates for the firmware that requires you to reflash the SD card your device came with, which is fine to do, but it's just just annoying that they couldn't do this like over Wi-Fi on device or something like and they force you to put your SD card in the computer and flash it yourself. This thing uses different emulators, not just RetroArch, to run all of the emulators like Drastic for DS and PPS plus PP for PSP. I don't like that name. It uses RetroArch for most systems, but I do like that they're using other things other than RetroArch for better performance because RetroArch is good at a lot of things. It can run a lot of lower end systems well, but I would probably trust the dedicated emulators more for stuff like DS and PSP. And it's nice to know they're not just sticking to RetroArch for Linux emulation. So yeah, the software isn't really anything to write home about. And especially since we don't have any custom firmware out yet, that's really all we can talk about. But before I talk about emulation performance and stuff like that, I want to talk about Garlic OS. So the Garlic OS 2.0 build that I put on my device for my impressions video was a pre-alpha, which meant it hasn't been officially released for the device yet. And which is probably why I was experiencing slowdown in GBA games. It'll probably be officially released fairly soon. The only reason that I thought it actually was was because it says it's supported on the page for Black Seraph's uh, Garlic OS 2.0, like on his Patreon page, and Taki Udon displayed it in his video about the 35XX Plus, so I was like, oh, I guess it's out. I guess I can use it. No, it's not done yet. So yeah, I would wait before trying to install it on an SD card. If there are any, like, actual custom firmwares that are out for this device, let me know that have been released. But yeah, Garlic OS should be released for this device fairly soon. It's just not out yet at the time of this recording. Moving on to pure emulation performance, I will do a showcase of what it can run in a second. I mean, I don't think it's going to be surprising that it can run SNES and GBA games, but I think it is important to just show it off so that you know that games you like are gonna be able to run. And I think it'll be interesting to show what kind of higher end games it'll be able to run. But before I do that, this thing can technically run at 64 games. Now PSP is probably more interesting and I'll show that off in the emulation performance like section, but I like Nintendo games. I'm not a big Sony fan. I have an Xbox and a Nintendo Switch. Don't have a PlayStation 5. So sorry, I don't care about PlayStation. But yeah, I'm more so interested in Nintendo emulation and I care about Nintendo 64 run games and how they run more than I do PSP. But seeing stock firmware play N64 games on a device as cheap as this one and with only a D-pad and face buttons is really impressive. The performance often isn't though. Seeing as custom firmware is what enabled Nintendo 64 games to run on the original device at all, I think it should help in that department, but view it as more of a bonus rather than something to buy the device for. Same for PSP. It doesn't really matter to me because I've been working my way through the first three Professor Layton games on the DS because I think this thing is perfect for DS games and emulation, but I know a lot of you don't really care about that. It might be because this has a four x three display like the DS and how the newly released firmware allows you to press the power button while playing DS games to activate a virtual stylus that you control with the D-pad, which makes playing DS games a lot easier and a lot more justifiable on this device because before that firmware, you couldn't really activate the virtual stylus without disabling the D-pad. But that new firmware makes the lack of a touchscreen less annoying because the only console that would have benefited from it now has a workaround and a good workaround at that. This is kind of Amronix doing. I mean, the virtual stylus was like available because of Drastic, 
but Ambernick making it like a feature to where you can press the power button and virtual stylus will appear, I think is a great addition. As someone who spent over 15 hours as of the time recording playing DS games on this, I think I can vouch that the virtual stylus he works really well. And since it's activated by something as common as the power button, it's a lot easier to use than to like do some button combination. I imagine it would be kind of annoying for devices that kind of switch between using the touchscreen and the D-pad a, a lot, but that's not my problem. Obviously nothing's gonna beat using an actual touchscreen for DS games. That's why I loved the 405 V and uh, the V I guess for DS games a lot because it was the same form factor but it had a touch screen, so it made those games a lot easier to play. But the workaround they made does work very well. I didn't mean to ramble on about DS emulation for so long, but there's not much more I could really tell you about emulation on this device as a whole without just showing you. So let me show you.
So for a device of this size and price, I think its emulation capabilities are really impressive. Obviously, you're not going to be able to play every N64 or PSP game, but it can play enough well on its stock firmware that I think it's a great value. Is it a good enough upgrade to warrant getting this if you have the original? That's definitely going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but generally, I would say yes. Only if you want to play higher end consoles though. If you are okay with what the original can play, if you've seen videos about what the original can play, or if you already have the original and you don't really care about N64, DS, or PSP games, you should be perfectly fine. But if you do care about playing DS games or N64 games or PSP games or however well they run, I think it would definitely be worth the upgrade. But if you do care about playing higher end games like DS or N64 or PSP on a device as small as this one, I think it would be worth the upgrade. And the plus of that is I'm falling backwards. And the plus of that is that you get to play the older games as well. Everything the, the previous model can play, this can play. It's just that now it's more powerful and can play more stuff. I feel like to any newcomer, I would definitely recommend this over the original just because I like this design better. I mean, even if you don't care about DS, N64, or PSP, I feel like the design alone, the upgrades that they have on this one are worth it. I know it's like a $16 upgrade, but for all of this, I feel like it definitely is worth the upgrade. But yeah, for anyone getting into emulation, the better performance and hardware might not mean anything to you, but it's certainly a nice extra if anything. I would definitely recommend this over the original for the hardware alone. Okay, to wrap this all up, let's go over what I do and don't like about this device. So what I do like has to do with the internal changes. Obviously, I love that it's more powerful, but it also has to do with the hardware changes. They are fairly minimal, but any upgrade they've made has been a very positive one for this device. The bigger shoulder buttons, the nicer D-pad, the bigger battery, and the new better colors all make the device so much better and so much easier to recommend. Like I said, the upgraded internals are major as well because they make playing things that are like higher end in terms of whatever you consider higher end easier to play. Custom firmware on the non-plus model enabled N64 games. You can get some N64 games running on here right out of the box. I can only imagine what custom firmware can do. The OS isn't perfect, but works well enough for what it is. I mean, it's not horrible. I like can stomach using it because I have for the past like week and a half. And the future custom firmware brings will only enhance the experience. But if you don't want to put in the work to get the custom firmware, you will not be disappointed with what you get unless you're like a snob who hates hates the basic firmware. For what it is, I think the basic firmware is pretty good. Now onto the negatives. The OS isn't the best, I guess. I don't really know. There isn't really much I can complain about this device because I can't complain about power. I'm not sure I'd want a device of this size to be way more powerful. And I can't complain about hardware because this thing is just an upgrade from the original and it makes the hardware so much better. The controls are a great improvement. The battery's bigger. I guess the speakers, but I mean, I'm gonna be fully honest. I don't use the speakers all that much. And while I was playing with the speakers on, I didn't care that these speakers were quieter. If the speakers being quieter matters to you, then I can see it being an issue, but it's not like the speakers are so quiet or anything. They're just quieter. I think it's a great introduction to handheld emulation and a great device to get if you just want to have something to take with you places for short gaming sessions or long gaming sessions. If my 15 hours of Professor Layton has means anything to you. But what do you guys think? Do you have one? Do you love it or hate it? If you don't have one, why? Do you want one? Are you gonna subscribe? Are you gonna click like? There's a like button down there. Do you wanna hit like and then subscribe to my channel? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll see you next week. Or, I don't actually know. I think my Odin doc's coming really soon. So I'll have a video for that whenever that arrives. Bye-bye.